Hello everybody, welcome to the Jersey Joe Corner. It is brought to you by Big Heads Media. It is going to be a great hockey season uh, coming right up. A lot of interesting things. Uh, Anchor.fm will help you uh, start your podcast and get things rolling. It's going to be a lot smoother when you uh, when you get the Anchor app and it's so much easier to navigate even their online website at anchor.fm is very efficient and you can do a lot of great things with it. Support for the Jersey Joe Corner podcast comes from Manscaped, who is the best in men's below the belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. That's why Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer. Their Lawnmower 2.0 has proprietary skin safe technology, so this trimmer won't nick or snag your nuts. Manscaping accidents are finally a thing of the past, and don't use the same trimmer on your face as you're using on your balls. That's just nasty. Manscaped also has the Cropped Preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant, and moisturizer. You already put the deodorant on your armpits. Why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest part of your body? Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code B I G H E A D S all caps at manscape.com always use the right tools for the job your balls will thank you get 20% off and free shipping with the code big heads at manscape.com that's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use big heads capital b i g h e a d s with the first pick overall the new jersey devils are proud to select from the u.s program jack hughes Oh. Hey, happy Thursday. It's Jersey Joe and... How's everybody? Devil's land. I think everybody's happy oh, to hear on. some news Yo, finally uh, from yesterday. Wi-Fi, despite it being oh, from Toronto. You guys around tonight? We're around. I'm... Yo, yo. Yo, yo. Yo, what's up? Happy Thursday. In and out signal. Sorry, I'm traveling. I'm on the road right now. Coming home. So I'm doing this from the car. But that's okay. <laughs> um, it is a great day. Jersey Jim here. Jersey Joe here. So um, back with another episode. Got a lots to cover. So many things to cover that... 
even the noise effects from Toronto are actually shaking the 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 whole league right now. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, so much stuff out there. Uh, you know, Mike Babcock gone. You know, we thought maybe Hines would be the first guy fired, but it looks like Toronto beat us to the punch on that one. I think they got a lot quicker with their punches, like Cam Jansen going after Pierre Luc Dubois. No, Pierre Luc Latorno LeBlanc. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah, it's crazy. I mean the news yesterday, four o'clock. It was like got the email. I was like, wow, they actually really did it. I thought they would have waited maybe till Sunday, you know, before they played Detroit. You know, give us some time. Boom, no. And then you come out today with, you know, you know the reports were out there that, you know, Dubis and Babcock were not on the same page at all. Mike didn't feel like, you know, Kyle was giving him a fair shake. You can clearly see it, too, because when McElhaney left, you know, you know, they, with, then they went with Sparks. It's like, hey, wait a minute, you're, you're, we're losing a quality backup. So, you know, I guess it was time. It just seemed like after backup goalie after backup goalie and relying a lot on Freddie Anderson, there's a bit of a theme there that the Devils can look at what not to do from what Babcock did. So you don't want to overuse – Blackwood to the point, you know, that it is good that they brought Louis Domingue, but, you know, you were saying the other night that, you know, Keith Kincaid could be brought back. That's a possibility. I mean, you know, Devils fans, you know, could still give them garbage, whatever. Um, you know, personally, Keith's a friend of mine, so I really never try to talk bad about him unless he has a really bad game. But from – talking with some people they were impressed what he did Saturday night um, against New Jersey and what he's done all year with Montreal I mean the change of atmosphere for him you know playing in a, a more playoff atmosphere and a different coach different culture I mean it raises his compete level one way or another but uh, we talk about compete levels um, you know someone else said about Hines or someone else said that the the coach's job is to prepare you for the the upcoming game, not to get your morale going. Right, and I think Brian Burke was talking about that today. The job, the coach, his job is to you know coach the team. The players are there to play. The players need to be prepared to play the game, and you can clearly see there's some things similarities with Devils and Toronto, um, you know, the biggest thing, like I said, the philosophy, you know, the players that were brought in in Toronto, they got a high-priced payroll. Um, it, you know, they're not getting it done. You know, you heard rumblings, guys don't like to play for him. He's a hard coach to play for. Well, guess what? Now it's on them to play. Now it's on them to perform and, and go out and win. And because and we- they took the easy way out. And once you get that silver bullet, you bite that silver bullet, you don't have too many other options left other than holding certain players accountable and other coaches accountable and other guys in the upper brass. So now it's up on Dubas and Shanahan up in Toronto. Now Ray Shearer is probably thinking, you know, you you got to look at the right move to make but you also want to do what's best for guys like Nico, Brat, Jack, just to name a few youngsters that need a more influential coach, but who's an upgrade over the current guy. Yeah, exactly. I mean. And one of the things is, you know, one of the criticisms with Babcock was he was too stubborn and didn't want to change. The opposite could be said about John Hines. He's too stubborn to – he's too stubborn and he changes all the time, and he doesn't want to just let things ride. Because you have line combinations that seem to be working. You don't need to change them all the time. Let them – like, let it ride it out. Let it play out. Just because it wasn't working for a 30-second shift doesn't mean it won't work the rest of the game. Yeah, I was listening to the raw like practice 
on the devil's uh, feed on YouTube and uh, Taylor Hall was mentioning those type of things going on with coach Hines. And, you know, if you can't really get the lines clicking or any sort of chemistry, how are you supposed to get things working? If you're going to Vitamix it all the time. Well, what did we talk about early on in one of our earlier episodes this year? And that brought up with uh, Taylor Hall's, you know, interview early on in Edmonton where he wanted to build chemistry with guys during training camp. And you can't build chemistry with a guy if you, if you constantly are changing things. And that doesn't help the team. And they say in business, you know, you can't just make a change for the sake of making change. You, you have to eventually build chemistry somewhere. When you build these four lines for forwards, but also the same could be said about the defense. Yeah, and that's the biggest weakness of New Jersey this season by far. I mean, look, Vontanen going out of lineup doesn't help. But there comes a point in time where you have to figure out who can play with P.J. Subban and and get that guy in there. And from what I've seen this year, I thought Vontanen and Subban played well together because Vontanen is smart enough to know that he doesn't need to be rushing up all the time. But we see on... When Vatnin is not with PK, he has to rush it up ice in the neutral zone and try and do a little too much at times because they're, not everyone is you know, taking the same amount of responsibility. Some guys are relying on the other. Right. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing in the coaching book that says you can't play your two best defensemen together. There's, there's nothing that says you can't do that. And, you know, just to bring it back to the leaf circle, it back one more time, you know, when Tyson Barry got there, you know, he was a certain player. He was an offensive defenseman. He played on the power play. He played in situations where he could succeed. He was playing on the first unit all the time. He wasn't doing that in Toronto. And, you know, I know Morgan Riley's there, but one of the biggest criticisms was, well, how come he's not on the first power play unit? How come he's not on the power play unit? How come he's not playing top line minutes? That's what made him so successful in this league. So you need, you need to roll with things. And, you know, Bonten and Subban together, I think, can work. It did for the games I saw. Um, and maybe they just need to go back with it and trust it. And if I was coaching, you know, in New Jersey, if I was Hines, I would allow, you know, Taylor Hall, Jack Hughes, Paul Mary stick together for the first five, ten games I would be coaching them. And then I'll do the same for every other line and, you know, except I won't be playing Hayden as much. But um, Rooney is currently out as a extra yeah. skater. Yeah, so, no, he's actually, he's actually uh, on the IR today. They placed him retroactively to when he got injured um, since he had been day-to-day. But he is on uh, injured reserve as of today. So This could be good news for uh, Bulkfist. It could be, yeah. I mean, it all depends on how these line combinations are – Put together, I'm not going to read into them as much today. As Closer to Friday. Yeah, if, if, if they do the same thing tomorrow, then I got to start to wonder. I mean, look, there comes a point in time where, as we said, the Leafs decided that it was time to make a change. At what point do the Devils decide, hey, this isn't, just work, this isn't working out anymore? Because there were numerous opportunities to make this coaching change, and they haven't done it. And, you know, we hate to sound like broken records, but, like, we tell our listeners, you know, when when you're building a team or rebuilding a team and you want to move up, uh, you and I can agree to disagree. I think Babcock, you know, he has a track record of improving a team that's underperformed from eight, from eighth to third in the Atlantic. And – Done really well, made them a 100, 105 point team, but they, they as in the Maple Leafs in the playoffs, weren't that successful, uh, blowing games to the Bruins. And you and you cover the Bruins on Boston Hockey now. Yeah, I mean, look, I will say for the, the guy, you know, he's a good coach. He really is, and and I hope people don't take this the wrong way, but the so called best coach in hockey got out coached twice by Bruce Cassidy. In and Cassidy of Bruce Cassidy, the head coach of the Boston Bruins, twice in game seven of the first round. 
I think the I think and and listening to Toronto radio, I think the writing was on the wall after they lost last year in the first round. You're you're going home up three two. You play a perfect road game. You have the lead in game six and you lose it, and then you lose again in game seven. I think the wheels started to turn on, okay, is Mike really the guy for us? And, look, he's done a great job. You know, people are going to criticize him for, you know, what's going on. And all due respect, from a doubles fan standpoint and a podcast standpoint, I don't hate the Leafs. I just hate the media side that really scrutinizes every single moment. I just feel bad for the personnel for the Leafs that, you know, they try and succeed, but it's hard for them to do certain things with such a closeness. Like, it's like smelling fresh cooking, but still the chef somehow gets the biggest criticism. So it's yeah. hard to operate. It is. I mean, look, Mike Babcock did everything and, and did everything well for them. I mean, like you said, they improved under him. They were really good. Uh, they, you know, they, they were there. Maybe they just felt, you know, with Sheldon Keefe in the system, they wanted to go in a different direction, and you know, you know, they just go from there. It, it's strange because I think you made the comparison one time that you know the, the certain markets, like for instance, the the Maple Leafs, they're like the Yankees of, of the NHL. Everything exactly. Is, they're everything is scrutinized. It doesn't matter. You know, how good they do. If they don't win, it, you know, it's a bad season. And you see it here in New York, in the New York area, New Jersey. You're a Yankee fan. It's not good enough half the time. And they and we criticize. So, you know, it, it's a tough market to play in. But, hey, it eventually had to come to an end. You know, you never like to see a guy lose his job. But No, it's like, in all, in all honesty, like, I didn't think Babcock was gonna get the the pink slip that early, but I thought if if I was a if I was a betting person, I would have put on Hines and Mon- and Montgomery because for them it's like you have all these great players, but then you look at Toronto where they have so many great talented forwards, but their D is okay, but it's not where it should be, and that's where um, what's his name the the B- the the big the big the big mouth guy Steve Dangle comes out of nowhere and starts like really jazzing up Leafs Nation into a craze, but I'm not gonna do that here in New Jersey. This we, you know, as as a whole, we are here to bring sanity, not insanity. Exactly, and you know the biggest thing to me is that you know the Devils and. And, you know, the fans need to realize that it, there is there is something to what they – what system that – but, you know, hearing statements from Shanahan and Dubas, they felt they need to go to in a different direction. And maybe sometimes the message just needs to be changed in a certain way that the guys get it. And it's time for a culture change up up north, but also – here in the what we call the Mid Atlantic, it's time. I believe it's time for a culture change too. Um, like for instance, Devils fans and ourselves, we're tired of this whole rebuilding, rebuilding. I mean, you know, Taylor Hall, you know, writing's on the wall. He wants to be out, no doubt. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Babcock is a candidate to come to New Jersey, like. Uh, like TVA Sports had like Minnesota and New Jersey as the top two as favorites for a Babcock landing spot. But you said a different name last night. You can mention that to the listeners. Uh, Dan Bilesma, he could be a fit considering, you know, the Penguins affiliation with, you know, Shiro. Ray Shiro. Yeah, but I mean – Look, it doesn't matter who it is, but again, try not to be negative here, but you know, you see what Babcock in their performance against Pittsburgh, and they they, they could have canned them the next day. The Devils played so well against the Penguins last Friday, 
and he came back against Montreal. And he thought, okay. And they were playing well against Boston, cut the lead 2-1, and then they go completely asleep in the third period. And I don't know what is changing from the first two periods into the third period because nothing should be changing, yet they got completely annihilated. The, uh, it's like what, what, what stupefies me or dumbifies me is like the first two periods, it's like boss is up 2 nothing in the first, but you hold them to the point you get to the second period, it's like 2-1. And it, it's, it's getting so close. Like you're thinking, okay, can we come back again? Maybe, but then it's like you get into the third period. Heinz must say something every other second intermission that must mix in, you know, the psychology of the team. And I, I wish Dr. Amy, I was just sending you that uh, podcast episode about Dr. Amy Kimball, and it usually depends on the personality and the character of the individual players. But I do think it's also the coach that needs to be held responsible. And Absolutely. A hundred percent agreed. Um, coaching, coaching does need to be responsible. Players need to be held accountable. Um, you know, all that is goes, you can't fire the players. Well, what do you do? You fire the coach. So I guess, I guess that, I guess that's the path that those are possibly going down. Um, I I think they're going to be the second team to make a coaching change. Something's if, got something's got to change because, again, you win two, and then you play okay, but then you get annihilated in the third period. And it's the third period this entire season that has completely been, um, just been bad for them, blowing leads, everything. As much as I agree or disagree with my own editor Nick Volano for Pucks and Pitchforks. He's like, everyone's overreacting towards the Boston Bruins. I know the Bruins are a grade A maple syrup team, but, you know, there comes a time where you should not have these brain farts in the middle of the third period. I mean, there's no excuse to let let loose on the, on the gas and then put on the brakes all of a sudden. Then you get rear-ended by the other team destroying you. In look, your own building. Look, did Boston – look, they're still a good team even without Patrice Bergeron. But they were in the game. You were in the game. You got another late third period goal like you did against Montreal. And everything just goes completely side, sideways. What changed? Must have been something in the locker room or on the bench. I don't know. Look, I'm, Because just, just speculating like – I don't know. I don't care if it's the Taylor Hall thing. I don't care if it's Heinz's ideas. Whatever's going on, you know, it's got to be Tommy Fitzgerald's call to tell, you know, Ray Shearer what's going on because you can't have this linger on so so far. I mean, you have a man assigned writing breaking news. Miles Wood gets a haircut. Who gives a bleep? Yeah, who cares? about that? Who cares? Come on. Who cares about Miles Wood and what he does with his hair? I don't care that he got a haircut. Personally, I, I don't I, really I, give a crap. I, you know what I said? Miles Wood, get back to scoring. Exactly. Like, that, that doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is, you know, what, what is this team doing performing well? Are they performing well? And look, the, tomorrow, tomorrow they go in, they play Pittsburgh. I, I mark my words, they will figure out a way to beat them because they do. It, it it's it's all on their bread and butter. They know how to win against a Pittsburgh team, no matter how good or how terrible. They know how to beat that Pittsburgh team. It's in their blood. Right. So then, what do you do the next night against a bad Detroit team? You got to play them really wisely because you can't let a scrappy Bertuzzi boy, you know, take away the sight of whether it's Louis Domingue or Mackenzie Blackwood or whoever you put in that, you got to keep him sh- shoved away from your goaltender. You can't allow it. You can't allow odd man rushes. You can't be sloppy against a Detroit team 
where Robbie Fabry looked fabulous in his debut, you 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 can't overestimate. Like I know the Rangers beat the Capitals, but that was because you know Lundqvist stole a bunch of really good goals against in a four-one yeah, effort. But, that was great eff- great effort by him. But if it wa- if it wasn't Lundqvist on his strong night and he came on his average night, it could have easily been six to one in favor of the Capitals. Like the same story could go for uh, throwing in, let's say Mackenzie Blackwood versus let's say team B, you know, th- that could have been make or break for Hines. Look, I mean, we, Blackwood has done some good things against, against, um, Boston, and he 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 pretty much held his own except for the third period. Um, Blackwood's been playing good, and you know there's a possibility that he goes back to back again this weekend. There's a possibility; it hasn't been ruled out yet. I still think there's going to be a time where Blackwood will need a break because he you you can't overuse a goaltender, but they also need a better effort from their third pairing defense and you know Connor Carrick is still out yet you know you want to see improvement with Mirko Mueller and the other pairing but the question is what how long can you wait until Carrick gets back you can't um he could he's I mean he has the he has surgery to repair a broken finger uh, and yeah. so so I mean He's out for a while. I mean, he's, you know, doing things on his own. But how you can't – you got to you gotta look at what's out there. You got to figure out what do you have in the system because right now something's not working and it needs to be fixed. And, I mean, granted, Dave, you know, again, you, you go through periods where you look good, then you look bad. And you look good and you're like, oh, okay, maybe they figured it out. Something isn't clicking somewhere. And it all starts with nine. It all starts with Hall's attitude. And no one wants a a, a half rear ended player attitude on on the team. Nothing against number nine, but it's about attitude. Like if Dr. Amy Kimball was working with Taylor Hall, I think this would have been solved already. But if he's not consulting with her as the team psychologist, you know. Th- it's hard to turn a star player back into the player who he is. But I do think, you know, Buffalo would be a good choice because they're sitting a couple really good defensemen that should not even be in the press box. One of them, my, one of my personal favorites, Colin Miller, a guy who's physical. He can shut you down and – He's one of those nice bodies that could easily be playing in New Jersey. Absolutely. I mean, he's, you know, I mean, Miller was a good guy. He was, you know, he's expendable. He was an expendable piece for Boston in when they, when they sent him over to um, Vegas. So, I mean, there are guys out there you got to look. I mean, it's not as easy as, you know, as, as we say it is. But there's ways to make things work. And, you know, obviously, you know, winning cures all and you got a positive attitude. But I think, I think personally for me, from what I've seen, is that, you know, Hall wants to play with certain guys. And as much as he says, oh, yeah, it's great to have Jack Hughes next to me and this and that, I think he wants, he shares his number one center. I think he wants to play with him. And, you know, he's just got this attitude problem that, you know what? And he's creating turnovers. He's not. He's not playing well. And it, 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 don't give me the point totals. Hey, he's averaging point per play, point per game. I don't want to hear it. Hit that. His play on the ice is, hasn't been indicative of his of what he actually can be. Like as much as I love, you know, goals, but Taylor is not meeting that goal expectation. He's exceeded more in the assists. And for me, that's a, that's, a scary, that's a scary sign. Like, from the eye test, he needs to be shooting more despite being snake-bitten. He has to be the guy who wants to take full authority 
and be able to shoot at will. Yeah. When, he, when he's not shooting enough and when he's not in the right areas and he's making too many passes, he's basically giving the other team, you know, check, please, I'm done. Like, he's he, like that. He, he he's tries like to do rebel. too much. Yeah, he tries to do too much at times. Granted, he stinks big and he's missing on breakaways and during his MVP season, those things were going in. But that's a guy that's, you know, thinking about more than just focusing on the ice. Yeah, the contract's a big problem. And look, I don't care what people say or think or whatever. When the moves, he calls out his general manager, says they need to make moves because they didn't make moves last year. And they made moves. And they made moves, but yet it still wasn't good enough. How come the contract wasn't reset? Yes, I understand both sides are a little hesitant. But there comes a point in time when it's like, okay, you know, dude, we did this for you. Do you really want to be here? The thing is, I don't see him wanting to be here. Like, no. When, when Ray Shiro made the trade for PK Subban, and he signed Wayne Simmons the net, like almost the next day or forty eight hours, it felt like. And then you trade for Nikita Gusev. I mean. What in the Sam Hill? I mean, you ask for skill and talent. I mean, there comes a point where there's going to be a bad divorce between Shiro and you have Taylor Hall. And Hall is going to eventually get the, the boot out the door. I mean, yeah. I mean, if if this was a fantasy world, I would have traded Taylor Hall already for a shutdown defenseman. Me too. I mean, it's fantasy world, but again, it'd be t- it's tough to do. Personally, it'd be, you know, I heard somebody say, you know, how long do you let it wait? Is it July? Is it January 1st? Trade deadline? I mean, if I'm a team looking to acquire him, is it is there a possibility of signing trade? Is he, he going to want to stay? How much do they want to give up for him? And how when do we want to get him in? Because if I'm a team that's rolling through, and – even though I think I can put him over the top, do I really want to jeopardize my chemistry? There comes a point where Darren Ferris is going to get so many interested teams uh, about his client and saying, I want a guaranteed sign and trade, and I will pay you the extra money, but I want to give New Jersey a fair enough contract to get your client. And there's going to be a time where Elliot Freeman breaks out something publicly. And I'm going to put this on the record because there's going to be no reason that we're going to get John Tavares or anything else like that. Ray Shiro is a Wheeler dealer. Even my brother-in-law who said that, who is a longtime Penguins fan from Pittsburgh, said that about Ray Shiro when he first became part of New Jersey. So, I'm just putting that out there that something good is going to happen that Shiro is going to do for us. And, I, I, and well, I mean, it's going to occur. I mean, I mean, look, the process has gotten started. I mean, we can jump around hoops, but I guess we should. The next thing we need to talk about is since Shiro likes to make moves, he made a move the other day. And it wasn't, it's not like it was, it wasn't a time coming, but Corey Schneider placed on waivers and then sent to, Binghamton, and I got to look at something. And he's supposed to report there. But um, as I'm looking it up, but yeah, I mean, look, they just sent $6 million to the AHL. And that's a huge contract for an AHL team in Binghamton, in upstate New York. I mean, you have so many really good young prospects in that system. I know they're not doing that well, but Yegor Sharangovich had the game winner the other night, and he seems to be promising, even though he's a bit of a project at the time being. But the Belarusian, you know, he could be someone who could work out on the bottom six. I mean, at this point, you know, you're you're allowing these European players to adapt to the North American ice in the AHL, just like when they brought over Sudanich. Um, well, he's not much of a project, but he's been on North American ice a lot longer since he was part of uh, the Hamilton Bulldogs, if I recall correctly. Yeah. 
I'm just trying to see any moves. No, they had. There's no uh, no moves yet because Cormier is, is still up with the team, um, with Binghamton. So, but I know from talking with people inside, um, yesterday it was interesting. They gave him an extra day to get his things together, um, and get his house in order because apparently this is not just a conditioning stint, and it's not. And it's something that he might be there for a long time. So there, there's going to have to be someone else babysitting Jack Hughes for the time being. It's crazy. I mean, look, I, when I first saw the news, I'm going to be honest, I said, oh, when I saw Deming come up, I was like, oh, well, here we go, Schneider, something with Schneider. And, and you know, it started to pick up. My first thought was, ooh, unconditional waivers, potentially a buyout, maybe a trade, something. And then, then they just say regular waivers. And I said, oh, okay. But the interesting note was that Cormier was up. And it was like, okay, well, and then I read reports out there that it says if, since Cormier is there, he can't report um, something with the AHL rules. And I was like thinking to myself, there's got to be something more to this story. There can't, it just can't be him going to Binghamton. And, and, I, and I was talking with somebody and they said, do you think he doesn't report? And I said, that's a possibility. It just seems like, you know, let, let me reverse the clock back to 2013. You know, I was watching that 2013 NHL draft at my old apartment. And I didn't think, you know, Lou Lamorella at the time was going to make the trade. But as it got closer to the ninth overall pick, You know, Gary Bettman comes up and he says, you want to hear this? And then everyone starts booing. He goes, you might want to hear this. New Jersey trades their ninth overall selection to the Vancouver Canucks. And Corey Schneider. In exchange for Corey Schneider. And so I was like, what? Like, I know everyone was in shock. At that time, that was a a steal, as Pierre Maguire noted. But it feels more like a a reverse steal if you look at it the past two seasons with Bo Horvat starting to turn out really well. Even though, um, what was it, Um, McGillis, Mike Gillis, uh, who who was the GM at the time, he he won that trade basically in today's date. A, A trade that is won is proven over time, but not within just one season. Yeah, I mean, at the time, I said it at the time when I was I was there live, I said to somebody, I said, Lou's just saved his job. Um, because, you know, everybody knew what was going on that season. And, you know, time, time was ticking on him, despite them going to Stanley Cup final in 2012. I felt that Lou, Lou had just saved, had, had saved his job for a couple of years. Because at the time, you're like, okay, you got Schneider and Brodeur to Schneider, it's fine. But the thing was, Last the first year with Marty, it was like all right, like it felt like they were trying to hold on, but they knew they had Schneider waiting in the wings, and he should have been playing more than he wasn't. And then the next couple of seasons, he was pretty good, and you're like, okay, we got a the franchise goalie. They gave him the new contract. He's like, okay, this is he's warranted. But you know, the problem is injuries, and that's the biggest thing that's derailed him, and and it's mental too because you don't know the next time. And the next time you go out there, you know, am I going to get hurt again? How can I play a certain style? And you saw it in the first game. Go back to the first game of the season. And like I said, he got, first cramped. Game set- he got cramped in the middle of the second period. But, but, but how does that happen after a good training camp? How are you getting cramps? Because then it's mental. It, it's a mental thing with him because it's like, all right, I just got cramps. I can't finish the game. Wait a minute. You have a whole third period to, to recover. You have 15 minutes. You can get rid of cramps. You can play. And the Devils were playing well. He, like, honestly, while telling our listeners, well, for those of you who didn't watch that first game, it was opening night versus Winnipeg. So for the first, you know, one and a half periods of three periods, Corey Schneider was looking phenomenal, and he was looking very good. And then something just happened, and my coworker, goes, he texts me, what the hell happened? You know, text me or else I'll ship you to Massachusetts. I said, I was like, yeah. please. I was like, please, Frankie, don't, man, please. Like, and the, and as, 
got closer, I asked someone to look on their phone, and she said, oh, Schneider has an injury. I was like, what? It's either a lower body injury or – and then someone else put out there that he had cramps. I'm like, what? I should have had some pickle juice. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy because, you know, you're not supposed to be getting cramps in the first game of the season, but he did. And, then, you know, obviously you see Blackwood. I mean, writing was on the wall too. I mean, Blackwood been playing well when he came in. You know, he played again. Second, he played two out of three weeks where there was back-to-back games he played in them. And it's like, all right, and then now he might do it again. So, obviously, the Devils were moving to Blackwood. I mean, eventually, I knew Blackwood would become the starter. I didn't think it was going to be this quick. But, you know, hey, it happens. You just hope a guy like that can get back to it. I don't know. I think his, as I wrote, I think his chapter with the Devils is over. I think I believe it is. I think they're figuring out a way. I think this is their way right now to get to the expansion draft because, obviously, I've been told and I've been saying it, they're going to expose them at that time or they're going to try to find a trade partner. I honestly, well, from opening night, just to tell our listeners, uh, my one coworker was like, what's going on with – this is another coworker of mine. He goes, "What what is going on with Corey? I said – Honestly, he's looking like his old, not so good self anymore. Look to him to be a buyout. I can't see him being used in the expansion draft because the way it's his health and his lower body. I just and the men and the mental side. Back to Amy Kimball, you know, it's all about the mentality and the personality. And if the personality can't have the mental side, you know, be equal into that portion, you, you can't get the same guy you got in the first couple of years when you traded for in, in Corey Schneider. I just, I just can't. But there's going to be a time where you're going to see Jill's Sen come up in the first couple seasons after he's done with Binghamton. I just think you don't want to expose him uh, so soon before the Seattle uh, expansion draft. Yeah, I mean, you you can't you can't you can't expect a young guy to come in and, and do it all. I mean, look, the Blues. The the reason the Blues did they were a good team. They just decided, hey, we got to ride Bennington. It, it, it's gonna come to a point where, all right, do we ride the kids and let them just play it out? Same with Blackwood, just ride them, just, just f and ride them, and just just be like, all right, this is what we're going with, and just ride everything. Or are we just going to keep piecing things together and trying to figure out, you know, all right, can we salvage the season? It's going to come to a point where it's going to be like, all right, if we're out of it, we're out of it. And that's it. I'll say this. If we're more than 10 points out in the middle of December, I am calling teams to trade for Taylor Hall and trade Wayne Simmons. As much as I love Simmer, I believe he deserves a better fate and it would be good to recoup like second and third round, fourth round draft picks and maybe a mid-level prospect, you know, if you're looking at that, because if you look at in recent, you know, years when the devils trade PA Parento for like a, what a fifth or something like that, you know, then the Devils traded Brian Boyle, who was just a fourth line center winger, who was really good in the faceoff circle, and was a presence. You know that got us a second rounder. I mean, there, Wayne Simmons could easily fetch us a second if we're basing off last year's uh, returns on investment. Yeah, and the Devils could be. The Devils need to be getting you know, picks back because obviously they don't have many. Um, I mean, they still have a lot, but you want to get value for these guys. And, you know, Simmons is one guy that you can get value for. Hall is another one. You look at Avant and to to see if what value you can get for him. Um, You know, there, you know, it it all depends on what you're looking for, what you want to do, how much surgery do you want to do? Do you want to go, like, take another step back and then go forward? 
Do you want to become Edmonton? You got to figure out how you're going to play, what style you want to play, who's going to be the coach. It's just so many factors being involved in this thing. And the Devils just are just like, all right, they're just, they're, they're not meeting expectations. Uh, the guys aren't performing right. Is it the system? Coach? It, I mean, it's just so much going on. It, 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 it's honestly, let me put it in perspective. This is basically like going to Chipotle. This is a burrito. We have so many options that we could wrap in in a different, you know, wrap that you can opt out of not putting in a certain guy, but you can mix in someone else that might complement your new sandwich or your wrap that it, it might be a little costly adding on other toppings, but these are toppings that could prove to be a good, a good, you know, fit over time. So let, let's just think of it that way. If, if there was just a few tweaks that, you know, you had to move Simmer or you had to move Taylor Hall, and then you have to move John Hines from the bench and then you go from there. And and that's the key. Like it, it, it when is it gonna be time to address the coach and the style of play and why is it not working? And what can they do differently in the third period? And why do they only play so well in the first two periods and then they just go just something changes? It it's there's gonna come a point and they're probably looking at it now. It's like okay. If Babcock can be fired, maybe... Hines can be fired. Exactly. I mean, if the message isn't getting clear and then the players are not listening to the message, maybe it's time for a change. Well, speaking of a message, uh, Mike Morial just texted uh, on Twitter. He says, Taylor Hall says he needs to step up and produce for NJ Devils. No, but, duh. Yeah, and then to put into quotes, when you're looking to go mano y mano against the other team's best players, guys like myself have to play better. No, duh, Sherlock Holmes. I mean, I mean, look, what's the old saying? No blank Sherlock. I mean, I, yes. I, I said this. Uh, I'm going to be honest, and people can disagree, you can disagree, I don't really care. As much as it's great to have a New Jersey Devil win the most valuable player, Nathan McKinnon was the guy that deserved to win it and is showing why he could have, he should have been the MVP that year because it doesn't matter if Ranton is out, Landis Gog's out, he finds a way to carry that, that Avalanche team. He puts them on his back. He's ev- always the best player every night. And uh, to put it in perspective, for those people who are still on the Capo Caco, Jack Hughes debate, this is why Nathan McKinnon went first overall. Because a center who carries that line is the guy that you build your franchise around. And it's not a knock against the wingers like uh, Alex Ovechkin type who did go first overall and then won a Stanley Cup. But if I had to start, you know, the New Jersey Devils franchise from scratch tomorrow, and you gave me Taylor Hall, Tyler Sagan, and Nathan McKinnon, I'm picking Nathan McKinnon. The kid's got speed. He's got determination. He has the eyes to make that line excellent. And he's a selfless player player he he actually cares to build a team around him and he trains with Sidney Crosby and they're both from Nova Scotia so anyone in uh, Nova Scotia listening in or anyone from Canada listening in please please let us know what you think of the Nathan McKinnon versus the other two players that I just mentioned I mean, look, Nate McKinnon, he's a beast for Colorado. I mean, they got they got a big tilt tonight with Minnesota, uh, you know, Dallas. Two hot teams right now, Dallas and Winnipeg going at it. And Big D, that's going to be fun. And and if people didn't see it, I did a little post on the Stars. Uh, they're playing team first hockey. And at the time, you know, it was astonishing to me that they were winning because Ben and Sagan weren't doing anything. 
And in their last couple games, Ben has six points. Sagan has seven points. Um, but they were called out again by their coach. And, and, they, and he was saying it was after the Winnipeg game when they lost 3-2 because Mark Scheifele scored in overtime. He's like, look, our best players need to be our best players every night. Look over there. Their best player just won them the game. So, I mean, look, Taylor Hall just is saying to himself, I gotta be, I'm one of the best players on this team. I need to play like I'm one of the best players on the team and one, one of the best players in the league. Good on him. It's great accountability. Now go produce. For, for us, you know, people in New Jersey, tri-state area, whatever you want to call it, we expect not words, but we expect actions. We want action delivered. And if we don't see it, there's a reason that I'm reiterate back to one of the other episodes. Fans will boo if you're not performing to the standards. And if you don't perform to the, the tri-state standards, you're going to get it. I mean, I don't care if you're a rookie or a longtime veteran or some schmo. You are going to get it. And even the coach yeah. is getting it. Exactly. And I know ownership. Uh, I know ownership's eventually going to feel it because I know the social media team. You told me that you know they rejected Rich Share with Lou Lamorello, who oh yeah, doing that, constructive that's, that's work. A, that, that was that was a great story. That's a funny story. Uh, yeah, I mean they look they look at the negative things. They don't want to hear it. Um, but and you can see that with some of the interaction on Twitter, when people get a little negative. They say, "Ooh, they, you know, it, you know." I hate to be, I hate to, you know, break it to the rest of the world and especially, you know, devils, I'm glad you're listening and people listen in, but a little criticism goes a long way. That's how you become better. And it's not always going to be criticism, but now when your team is not performing and people suggest don't change things or change things or this and that, people, if you notice something, People expect results. When a team is doing well, people are there. When a team is not doing well, people aren't there. Winning cures everything. But no one wants to go and watch a team like like it is right now. They can it, find it, so, something better else to do or just stay home. Like, for instance, I, I always talk to a few season ticket holders in person. And, you know, they, 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 they talk to me and I say, you know what? I just can't see... A and B around for so much longer. I mean, something's got to give. It's a culture. It's a culture thing. It's a psychological thing. You know, there's so many. There's so many things that need to amend. And when you also, let's say the Devils are in the top sixteen of the draft selection again. Let's just say the Devils don't make it into the top three but they get into, let's say, the top 11. I can see them getting uh, Marco Rossi or Tim Stutzle. You know, those guys, a, a left winger in Stutzle is, a, is actually a pretty good, like, like hard-nosed player, will play, you know, tough for a guy's size at five foot nine in the offensive zone. And then, you know, he's a left wing in the, in the Deutsche Elite League where Adler Mannheim is, uh, that's his team, which is more insiders. And then you have Marco Rossi, the Austrian, who plays for the Ottawa 67s. And he's also a friend of Nico Heesher's. And he plays for a really good Ottawa 67s team. You probably know these names already, but uh, Graham Clark, and you have Nikita Ochotyuk, who are teammates of his. And I wouldn't be surprised if today was the NHL draft and the Devils select Marco Rossi. That's because he plays a similar style to Nico Heischer, but he's a little bit more of a faster, more shifty, more creative. He does play a similar style to Nico, but he does play those hard-nosed areas in the slot, in the crease, you know, you want to see those type of guys with that kind of grit. And when you have the right coach for those players, it makes the best dynamic team you can have. 
Absolutely. And you want to have chemistry between your players. Uh, and that's, you know, one thing that you, you haven't seen right now. Obviously, you know, at times you saw Zaka play with, with Heesher and that was doing well. And then they, they went back to Hall, Heesher, Paul Mary. Then you saw Hall, Heesher, and Brat. It got to stick with stuff it, so they can develop things. And sometimes you just got to let it ride out. And I will say, like, you know, you watch the Avalanche, you watch the Hurricanes, you'll see moments where some guy has just his peripheral vision and makes, like, a, a lateral pass. Or, like, the other night, that pass from Robert Thomas for that nice, beautiful goal from, like, you know, a fadeaway pass, that was a magnificent goal and an assist that was sick that was on NHL tonight. I mean, those are the kind of selfless plays that make a team very exciting to watch along with playing great defense. Yeah. I mean, you got, and look, the blues, you know, the blues figure out they're a hot team right now too. They're figuring out, they're figuring out how to play better. And, but they've built the chemistry and they're, they're really not changing much. Um, with the fact that, you know, when guys are in and out of the lineup, they know guys can plug right in and fit fit right in because they play a certain way. And and that's what you want to see with New Jersey too. Like, all right, you set your lines and then there's an injury, but this guy can step right in and play that role. Or if you have to shift somebody up or down, they can do it. Right now it's just mismatch everything and we just put it in a, a blender and seeing what comes out and we're not sticking with things. And that's the most frustrating part because at times you see lines together and they're playing well, but the minute they just don't do anything, it's like, oh, well, we, they're not, they can't be together anymore. No, they just had a bad shift. Okay, it happens in hockey. Like, I, I've played in, on teams where all right, the, the line mates I had, you know, we just had a bad shift. It happens. The coach wasn't like, he would tap us on the show and be like, hey, what happened there? Be like, hey, we just had a bad shift, got pinned in, didn't get, generate much. And he'd be like, all right, we're going to put you out there again. And, and, you know, and then the next shift we realize, hey, what mistakes we made and we're back doing what we're doing. And it, and it reminds me like when I would play floor hockey in a competition. So it reminds me like when I would have a couple of teammates, I would say, you know, switch a wing or pass it to me on my, on my, left, on my left wing side and, Maybe I'll go uh, five hole on someone or I'll go uh, shoot it in one of the corner spots. I say, just get, just get traffic up front. Let me, let me take care of business. Let me, let me do my snipe, my sniping. And if, and if it bounces, just tip it in. And that's the kind of thing that a coach, good coaches understand from really smart players is that they will take the authority. They'll stand up. And they will, you know, take charge of the play. And when you don't have a coach that allows that sort of chemistry and creativity, it's hard to win. And it's hard to, you know, break through. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got, you know, I was up at the, after we, you know, after my team performed uh, Friday night, you know, did well. I didn't really change much. You know, it was a pretty dominant game. But then I played on Saturday in the charity game, and, you know, it was fun, mustache, classic. We raised money for, you know, mental health, health awareness, suicide prevention, cancer, all the fun stuff. Close game going into the third. We would go down a couple of goals. Guys I were playing with, you know, they weren't bad guys. We were generating some things. But I noticed there was a player on the second line that we were playing with, and I said, hey, come up with me and play with me. And I said to my and one guy, I said, look, we're just going to try to just roll with it. We're going to go and put a power line out last couple of minutes, see what happens. And ended up winning the game because we just put the players together. That's okay to do. But you can't be doing that, you know, after two bad shifts in the first period. Oh, well, it doesn't work anymore. Got to split guys up. Got to put this guy up here. This, it's like, no. Like, honestly, do you see Team Canada switching, like, Mm -mm. for instance, like their top line? No, they keep it together. They know who knows each other. Like, for instance, Lafreniere is playing on a really stable first line with one of last year's uh, right wings. I forgot the name, but uh, 
if you if you see the roster that they put the projected roster out, and Ty Smith is also on the first pairing defense line, you know that uh, that allows stability because Team Canada has kids who are you know U twenty and under eighteen that can click. So there, these really good stable you know hockey powers understand how chemistry works but the thing about John Hines is that he used to be the USA hockey development coach used to be an AHL coach etc but he doesn't quite understand what it means to be an NHL style coach but he's a rebuilder coach but right yeah. now things things are backfiring yeah, I mean, I, I, and I've talked with people. It seems like he was better when he did more with less, and he can't, and he's doing less with more. And for people to understand is when he first came in, the Devils didn't really have a lot. They really didn't. And the team was very competitive. They, they played well every night. They were hard to play against. This team is not hard to play against. I, and I've said, it, I've said it multiple times on Twitter. I've wrote it in many articles. I see... Teams like Detroit, teams like Columbus, um, Kings even lately. Teams that are at the bottom of the lineup. Minnesota, another team out there. You know, Sharks are figuring it out. Nashville is, you know, they're, they're you know, sputtering. But the, it doesn't matter what the score is. They're never out of a game. They're just never out of it. They always play hard, especially Detroit and Columbus. And Columbus, I said at the beginning of the year, could be one of those teams competing for a, a playoff spot, granted, they lost a lot of guys. But, you know, when you have a coach like Tortorella there, you know, Blash Hill's out in Detroit, but you have Steve Eisenman there. They're, 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 their games are close. Yeah, they may lose, but they're, they're not getting blown out. They're playing well. And, and that's what you want from New Jersey. And, and if we had more coaching stability, I said, you know, if Hines got to be pink slip tomorrow, I think temporarily it goes to uh, Tommy Fitzgerald for the least amount of time. But I I think Guy Boucher is one of those candidates that comes in as the fixer. And then you go into the offseason, maybe Dan Bilesma agrees or Babcock. Who knows? I mean, there's so many ideas out there that, you know, ever since Babcock got fired yesterday, there's – I put in one of my articles about – in the Puck Authority saying, you know, there's like – well, I actually put on the Jersey Joe podcast account. I put that there will be a, a ripple effect in the coaching market. So, it's it's going to occur. Yeah, and uh, look, eventually it's going to happen. Just don't know when when the tipping point comes, if the tipping point comes. But if this team with this expectation, and and I said too, can you chalk it up to guys? You know, you have new faces in there, so could you chalk it up to guys not understanding a system, not you know clicking together, building. But that's the point of building chemistry, so they can understand the system and not get adjusted. A lot of guys that are trying to do too much. PK is one of them. Taylor's another one of them. The, they think they, they need to do all this stuff, but then mistakes happen. So put guys with guys that are comfortable, let them perform, and see where it goes. And so per BBM Hockey, uh, better know. Okay, so they put out under Ben Misfelt, Team Canada projected roster for the World Juniors. Alexi Lafreniere, Joe Valeno, Thomas, Cole Perfetti, Quinton Byfield, Dylan Cousins, Alex Newhook, Connor McMichael, uh, Lavoie, uh, Liam Foody, Ty Delandra, uh, Noel, uh, and then Peyton Krebs as their, uh, as their 13 uh, forwards. Bone Byram as their defenseman, along with Ty Smith on the same line. Uh, Jared McIsaac, you have Drysdale, who's available in this year's draft. You have Ball and JBD, and then you have Thomas Harley. 
and then you have Jones and Rodrigue in net, and then you're missing in the NHL is Barrett Hayton, Kirby Dot, and Dobson. So that's a formidable lineup for Team Canada. They look. It looks like on paper that they might win the whole thing, but uh, it it could be something that might be a like one of those top two medals at the minimal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we don't know what we don't know what the uh, we don't know what um, Sweden Finland rosters are going to look like. Uh, the Team USA, obviously. We don't know what their roster is going to look like, who's getting invited where. So, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see, but it's going to be fun. I mean, look, Devils tomorrow night, bring it full circle here, Devils tomorrow night. They got Pittsburgh team they've beaten in the past. Pittsburgh's got a game tonight against the Islanders. I mean, that's going to be a fun game to watch. Those teams have played two great overtime games. So, you know, I think I expect that one as I wrote today and, my prediction sure to go wrong that that's going to go to overtime somehow because uh, the last two games have. Uh, you know, you got Toronto, you know, Sheldon Keefe's first game in Arizona. That's not that's not an easy game either uh, for them. And then obviously, you know, another big tilt is Stars and Jets, which I think the Jets might win that mm-hmm. one the way they've been playing on the road. The Jets seem to do a lot better in other people's buildings for some reason. It, it just seems like they bond better on the road. Yeah, I mean, and look, you know, everybody talks about, you know, defense. Well, look, Nathan Bowie comes back for the Jets, and their defense core seems to be settling down a bit. So, and because guys are being put in their natural positions now that Bowie's there. And, I mean, it's not like Bowie is, um, you know, some superstar defenseman, but he's a he's a great he's serviceable. A good NHL de- serviceable NHL defenseman. And, he- and with the losses they had on defense – he, he just plugs right in. And also, like, what I saw last night was that the Players Association made, what was it, an, an appeal for uh, the suspension of uh, Dawson Bufflin. So there could be something going on if the Players Association wins in favor of uh, the $8 million salary for Bufflin. So until something happens with Winnipeg, on that situation, there could be something done with Winnipeg, you know, for a move. I just don't know when that will occur. Jimmy? Jim? Jimmy, you there? Hold on a sec, Jim? Jim? Yo, Jim, we were just talking about uh, Nathan Beaulieu being a serviceable uh, defenseman. So, and then, just... yeah, and then we got into the Dustin Bufflin thing. Yeah, which, yeah. yeah, which I was saying that, you know, they're looking into the injury when it occurred. Um, 
you know, how much money you can recover. I was, I was just trying to say that. It, all that stuff. And I was going to say there might be back pay or something like that or somehow – I mean, they just had the uh, what was it the the players union and the uh, the the GM meeting yeah. recently, and it seems like you know they're going to test that and see how that goes, and maybe after that sort of dust settles for our listeners. Once that dust settles, uh, it seems that you know other teams can try and you know. Pick up someone off Possibly. of Winnipeg. You know, we'll see where where it goes. I mean, Winnipeg we're probably not gonna right now gonna do too much because they're winning and you know things like that. They got they really don't they really can't do too much things right now. But I mean, look, it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun night of action. Uh, Devils tomorrow only like two games tomorrow Friday night and then they're back at it Saturday night. Um, in Prudential Center, um, hockey fights cancer night if you're in the building, um, which is always a great cause. Uh, but like I said, enjoy the games tonight. Um, if you're watching, um, and my phone's about to die, so I'm probably gonna have to wrap. Uh, and and for our fellow listeners, thank you for tur- for tuning in. For those domestic and abroad, thanks for uh, for listening in, and don't forget to uh, get that promo code for Manscape. It's uh, Capital B I G H E A D S on manscaped.com. Save 20% off your order. Yeah, and uh, you know, to those that listeners out there, appreciate the compliments, uh, the comments. You know, been, you know, just building here, you know, lots of good things to come in our way, your way. Um, just stay tuned for the latest episodes. Use the big heads code at manscaped 20% off. It's a huge deal. Um, you know, just it helps you keep clean for the ladies and makes you smell good too. Um, I I use it too. So um, yeah. Again, just enjoy the games tonight. Uh, and be safe this weekend. Whatever you're doing. But don't be uh, Sean Avery. Right. Exactly. You don't want to uh, be a bonehead. Exactly. Don't be a bonehead. But have fun out there and enjoy but the games. Have fun. Let's go Devils. Let's go Devils. Woo! Woo!